Hello, I'm Andrew Suskind, and I'm a psychotherapist and author based in West Los Angeles since 1992, specializing in trauma and addictions. Welcome to our podcast, which I call It's Not About the Sex, also the title of my recent book. Here we focus on all topics related to compulsive sexual behavior, often referred to as sex addiction. In particular, we explore ways to build long-term, sustainable recovery while establishing more meaningful connection and greater intimacy. Our intention is to offer fresh viewpoints, brand new perspectives, and practical user-friendly tools toward living a more deeply connected life. Let's get started. So today, I am really pleased to have my friend and colleague, Rhonda Milrad, joining us. Rhonda is an LCSW, which means that she's a licensed clinical social worker. She's been in the field of sexual addiction for more than 25 years, about the same time as myself. And Rhonda specializes with partners and couples with trauma, with sexual issues, and relationship issues. She is a certified clinical sexologist, a somatic experiencing practitioner, a certified EMDR practitioner, and Rhonda can be reached at rhondamilrad.com, and I'm going to spell that for you. It's R-H-O-N-D-A-M-I-L-R-A-D.com, rhondamilrad.com. Rhonda also does relationship coaching, and she administers a Q&A forum about relationships at www.relationup.com, and I'll spell that, R-E-L-A-T-I-O-N-U-P.com. And when Rhonda and I were preparing for this podcast, she wanted to talk about the subject, about how couples deal with sexual betrayal. And as many of our listeners know, sexual betrayals are something that are not easy to heal from. And sometimes they're one-time betrayals or sometimes they're, they're compulsive, they're ongoing. Um, but when, when clients don't have access to a sex addiction specialist or they can't afford the time or the money for therapy and, and have to navigate this process on their own, this is really a passion of Rhonda's. And as we talk together, Rhonda's going to be sharing with us story and give us examples to illustrate how she works with couples who are dealing with with these uh, ruptures. So again, Rhonda, I'm so pleased to have you here with us today. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you so much for having me here. I'm so excited to be part part of your great um, podcast and um We've been friends and colleagues for a very long time, so it's really a pleasure to be here with you. I can't say how warm my heart feels because (laughs) Rhonda and I have been doing this side by side in parallel practices here in Los Angeles for 25 years, more than 25 years, actually. Yeah. And, and. You know, Rhonda's a, a psychotherapist in private practice in Beverly Hills, but she also does relationship coaching. And as I said, she administers a Q&A forum about relationships on this website, relationup.com. So, Rhonda, I'm wondering what it is that can tell us about how relationship coaching uh, fits in, in in treating partners of sex addicts and couples. Well, as you uh, so eloquently said, you know, what I began to notice as I was working many years in my private practice that there were so many couples that called me or our partners um, that called me and they needed help. They needed guidance. You know, their world had been turned upside down. They didn't know what to make of any of what they had discovered. Um, and usually, you know, uh, it was kind of a, a slap in the face kind of discovery um, where it wasn't something necessarily that they were looking for. And so they would call me and and they just couldn't afford the resource, the time, the money. They didn't have access, et cetera, uh, to qualified people. And so um, it really became a passion of mine at that moment to try and help couples and individuals who are part of the coupleship through you know, the beginnings of um, uh, creating a framework for them of how to deal with and understand what was going on in their world. Um, and how a plan almost 
of how to walk down this pathway in their own relationship. So I created this free forum uh, so that there would be an opportunity to help people deal with these issues because, as you very well know, Andrew, they really turn your world upside down and then they affect your family relationships, your work, your happiness, your health. So that was really the motivation behind it. You uh, you asked about, you know, how you begin to lay this out. Well, what usually happens on the forum is that somebody writes in a question of, regarding some betrayal that they had experienced. Uh, so, for example, someone can write in saying, you know, I went on my boyfriend's phone. I know I shouldn't have done that, but I, I noticed that he's been looking at other girls on Instagram, liking their stories. I know I looked in you know, uh, I secretly looked at his d- direct messaging and saw that he was in communication with them. Sometimes the they find really impactful information, like uh, he said, I can't wait to see you. I love you. Last night was great. And then sometimes it's questionable information, like, yeah, I'll talk to you tomorrow at the office. But the partner still feels that they are, that that was a betrayal to them. They had no idea that these private conversations with other women in this case were going on. So Mm -hmm. there's those type of uh, situations. Mm -hmm. And then the other, go ahead, sorry. No, 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 sorry. I just wanted to to make sure that we can bullet point this piece because what I'm hearing you say is that a betrayal is really something that's defined by the individual, right? So if somebody Mm -hmm. feels like a behavior by their partner is dishonest and is a a secret and and is might be a lie as well, that that oftentimes the pain that they experience as a result of that discovery is is so great and that we can call that or the individual can call that a betrayal. So I'm I'm kind of circling back to the idea of yeah. what really is a betrayal and and is it always a cookie cutter identification or is it something that the couple has to define between themselves? I uh, that's a really good point. I think that the couple defines it uh, uh, amongst themselves as well as uh, sometimes an individual defines it. So, for example, if a partner if a client discovers that some that that their partner has been masturbating to pornography, for some couples that's not a problem. For some individuals, that's not a problem. For others, mm-hmm. it is. Mm-hmm. And so, that person who discovered it, if they felt uh, that it was a betrayal of the relationships according to their own values or needs, then they would. Uh, define it that way. But for others, it wouldn't be defined that way. Mm -hmm. Um, So there is a subjectivity in the experience. So the first thing I'm often looking for when a question comes in about betrayal is that, is this uh, an issue that almost anyone would say is a betrayal? Like the, the text, the information clearly shows that someone had had um, sex outside of the relationship without that person's knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. And the second thing that I'm looking for in it, or or is this a moment where the person's defining it themselves as some betrayal, like the masturbation example I gave you. And because my answer to the situation becomes different depending on whether it's something that just isn't, it doesn't go along with, um, the values and and uh, uh, of the uh, the person as opposed to um you know an objective standard that someone is clearly breaking the rules of the relationship mm-hmm. so really you're an investigator from the beginning you're you're starting to get from the time the question comes in you're you're already starting to help them and yourself look at what would be a a healing direct direction for them because i really appreciated your words you said we come up with a plan we 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 look at a pathway and i'm wondering if if we can just talk for a moment about how this differs from classic psychotherapy because it's very very directive the information Mm. that i give them is actionable Mm-hmm. I will 
point out to them that there might be underlying issues here that they should investigate or ought to investigate in some cases with a therapist. And I may even point out what that issue is. And I can give you another example of that, but which I'll come to in a minute. But the, sure. the, the information is very actionable, very directive, where they kind of have a blueprint in their head of how mm -hmm. to begin to deal with this. Mm -hmm. uh, because I want them to take the blueprint and be able to utilize that throughout the course of how they're moving in their, reco in their recovery as a couple. Mm -hmm. I want them to remember, oh, Rhonda said I should not back down from this, or Rhonda said I should handle it this way. Back then, I'm, I'm assuming I handle it this way again. You know, I want them to be able to use that as a blueprint for their healing. Mm. So say more about the specific goals. I heard the actionable piece, which sounds yeah. very powerful and forward thinking. But tell me more about the goals that you're hoping to instill in these, these folks. Okay. The best way that I can describe it is that I, I want them to... I want to be able to educate the person about what I believe is happening at the moment and give them choices off of what, where they can go, what different paths they can take based on the um, investigative work that I've done and the, and the framework for uh, what I think is going on in the relationship. And so I ultimately want to give them direction of the choices they can make and for them to think about what choice is going to best be best for them in their life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's the basic idea of to give them options that they can then investigate the options on their own about what is the pathway they want to take. Mm -hmm. Because for example, if it turns out that the, their partner has actually had an affair. There'll be different options to take than if they feel that um, they're just more, they're more just upset that their partner is talking to other women, for example. Mm -hmm. So I'll get a uh, someone will write in and say, um, I noticed that um, I work with my boyfriend. I'm just making in this case the women, the men going outside of the relationship and the women um, writing the letters. Because the thing that's interesting on my Q&A, it's about 70% women and 30% 30, uh, 30 men. Mm. So I do get uh, many more women talking about betrayal than I get men. And even of the 30% men, the questions are usually about how do I win her back, not mm. about her betray betrayal. Mm -hmm. So so the, the woman will, will often say, I'm not... I don't like that he talks to other women at work. I don't like that he's still friends with his old girlfriends. I, you know, things of that sort. So that sort of issue, and this is more investigative work, where I begin, what I begin to think about is, does, is the boyfriend really doing something that's problematic here? Or does it just feel threatening to the partner? Because the partner has maybe an anxious attachment, some insecurity, where they're feeling that at any moment they're going to be dumped by their boyfriend. And so everyone becomes a threat to that person. So when I'm assessing what the betrayal is about and how to um, heal that betrayal, there is the option, for example, that I will point out to the person that in a relationship, like, for example, number one, your partner wants to have friendships with women outside of the relationship. And what you have to decide here is, can, uh, can you handle that? Can you give him that freedom? Because if you don't, you might find that he's resentful, that his mm -hmm. life has been shrunk by your insecurity. Mm -hmm. can, are you willing to go and work on that? Because for some reason, you've come out of your childhood feeling like my partner's going to leave me and every all these women are threats as opposed to feeling secure that my partner can have a friendship with a woman and it's not it's going to threaten our relationship at all. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then the other, so that would be an example. And, and if the answer is no, I'm not willing to, I, I don't, I want a partner, then I go through the steps of what exactly then 
do you need to what uh, do you need to ask of your partner in order to feel secure in the relationship and see if your partner is willing to do that mm -hmm. so that would be a uh, very actionable advice um, where uh, based on the partner owning some of the uh, the feelings that there's been a betrayal here. Um, and on the other side of the road, when there's actually been some sort of betrayal, then I will give the partner actionable advice for how to begin, how to confront their partner, mm -hmm. um, what to actually say uh, to suggest that they uh, they have the option of looking for further evidence or not, and the positives and negatives of all of that. Um, um, just circling back to confronting their partner, um, mm -hmm. how how to hold toe the line to not let their partner uh, gaslight them or convince them that things haven't happened that have, or to uh, mm -hmm. find uh, believe their excuses, you know, to help them ground themselves in the fact that they know what they heard and how they need to deal with that. And then mm -hmm. giving them direction of, do you stay with this person? If so, given your circumstance, because some of the people have children together, some of the people can't afford to leave. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what boundaries would you like to request of your partner to feel safe and secure again in this relationship. And I actually mm -hmm. spell out for them also that sometimes um, it's not going to, you know, um, that is a bit of a risk. Mm -hmm. That you don't, you don't know uh, whether the person's going to meet your needs and set those boundaries that you need set to um, gain trust again. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to highlight a few things because I think this is so significant what you're sharing and what really differentiates what you're describing from the classic therapy. So initially, when you talk about educating the partner, what I heard was you're actually educating them to what choices they really have, you know, to make an informed decision based on really sorting out for themselves and knowing that they have different avenues that they can choose. So it's a very empowering piece in, in the education phase. Mm -hmm. And then and then I hear that there's a, a really important part of this, which has to do with the, well, actually both people, but certainly the betrayed partner, the idea of, of really tuning into themselves and and focusing on, on self-care and what it means to feel their whatever that is that they're going through, but but ultimately how to attend to themselves and be really, um, I'm just adding words to it, but kind and, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and patient with themselves. And then I, I love the word actionable because this is a little different than therapy, of course. What you're, mm -hmm. you're saying is, is, is that you're providing guidance and advice and helping them develop specific action steps. And I think that's what sometimes gets missed. I mean, therapy is fantastic for understanding and awareness and looking at themes and patterns of the past. But one piece that doesn't always get emphasized is what what next? And and that feels like the the golden opportunity for for these clients that you're talking about to start to map out what what they really want and, and how they're going to do that and how you can help them uh, walk a new path. Right. Is that right so far? Yeah. No, so far. I mean, Andrew, you put it so beautifully, um, it, just perfectly, mm. perfectly. Um, you know, when I worked with um, partners, uh, much of my work in sex addiction before I, w I worked with couples was with partners. And when I worked with partners, it literally would break my heart that their lives had often become nothing but anxiety and worry that their partner was going out again and uh, engaging in sexually compulsive behavior or betraying the relationship again in whatever way. And they would spend all their energy and time um, just um, monitoring and panicking and managing. And I, it really, it, it was devastating to them and it was really painful to watch. And so I am 
often uh, very drawn towards wanting to make sure that the people that I'm giving um, this um, sort of uh, these plans is actionable advice to really begin to see the reality of what's in front of them um, Mm -hmm. and what they're dealing with in a very um, realistic way. Because Mm -hmm. I'm trying to help them to not just believe that everything's going to be fine because he or she said it was never going to happen again and now I can ignore it or I'm going to spend the rest of my life uh, with this person being anxious that it's going to come back and monitoring them and using all my energy that way. I don't want those to be the two choices. Mm. Absolutely. So I I really want the person to see that there's so many options here and they have to think through all all the options as it relates to their psychological makeup, their economic situation, their cultural situation. I've had people write me who've been in arranged marriages where this sort of thing is happening and from other countries and they don't know how to, they can't leave. They just can't. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. And so the advice then becomes, how do they live a grounded life? Uh, Mm -hmm. Letting, in this case, letting that go on, but not being swept up in it. Mm -hmm. Because they have no control over their partners. So, so I'm just trying to really give them almost in a very short, um, intense way, like psychoeducation about themselves and the situation. Which in itself is very empowering. Right. I'm Mm -hmm. hoping so. Well, you know what I what I have found, and I think you've had the same experience. Is there's there's relief when a client starts to turn on the light bulb and understand more about themselves and the situation because it's so isolating. Oftentimes, sometimes mm-hmm. I'm sure people will call you who are afraid to tell anybody about mm-hmm. what happened, and so you may be the very first person for them to share their story with and and how important that is for them to be able to get beyond the bubble of just their partner and themselves it in itself can be a healing uh, beginning. Yes, absolutely. And some people, it's not just their embarrassment that's preventing them from reaching out in any way. It's actually that they don't have any resources. You know, they're in mm. they're in small little uh, communities that are very strict, whether it's religious or cultural, and and they have no one to go to about this whatsoever. Mm. So they haven't told anyone in the world that this mm. sort of stuff is happening. And you know, the truth is, and uh, you know, my heart is very sympathetic uh, to this as well. But uh, which is that the men, um, and I'm just making it men, women again. But the, mm-hmm. the the men don't have anyone to turn to either. Right. Um, but that's a, a different than the work I'm doing at the moment. But mm-hmm. and on some of your other podcasts, people have um, talked about lots of different resources and ways of, of for someone who's engaged in that behavior to help themselves. So. Right. So I wanted to just come back to something that we touched on, but but it really sparked my interest, which is the idea that. Not all betrayals are based in out of control sexual behavior. Mm-hmm. And 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 yet sometimes there's some confusion, I think. And and I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about how you distinguish someone who could benefit, right? A, 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 let's say a husband who could benefit from some type of further work or 12 step or therapy around sexually compulsive behavior versus someone who may not really quite fit that mold. I think, um, you know, given that I'm speaking about relationship coaching, I'm going to answer it through that, through those eyes today. Mm -hmm. And I think that when there's a history of multiple events that occurred, sometimes uh, across and most often across different kinds of behavior, when there's been some sort of experience where the partner has caught the person and the partner thought it was being dealt with or the person was, you know, we're going to address it in some way. And then it happens again. Those are circumstances that 
that I tend to think more about something compulsive than Mm -hmm. a situation that might have a flavor of a one-off experience, like, and that has a story behind it that kind of makes sense. Like, my husband and I aren't getting along well. We haven't had sex in three years, three months. You know, we, uh, you know, he spends a lot of time outside the house. I found out Mm -hmm. that he's having an affair. Where there's Mm -hmm. a, might be, I'm always thinking about the compulsive nature of it and adding, Mm -hmm. and, 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 suggesting sometimes that this also could be something that's bigger than this and right. planting the seed with them just mm-hmm. so they, they know that's out there. Mm. But sometimes if there's more of a context to the story, there isn't the, um, the breadth of the behavior, the length of the behavior, the, uh, the acting out, the behavior across modalities, you mm-hmm. know, that I'm, He's doing X, Y, and Z, not just X, you know, kind of thing. Um, Then I think more about the compulsive nature of it. And Mm -hmm. especially if there's been the element of promises and broken promises. Mm -hmm. I swear it's never going to happen again. And it happened again. You know, and if there's lying. Mm -hmm. And that's another big component in it. When someone tries to say no, that, you know, when people don't take responsibility for the behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and and are presented with lots of evidence, then I also think about, at the very least, they need extra help to come out of the denial of it, rather than someone who says, you know what, you're right, I am having an affair. I am seeing mm-hmm. someone, I am going to prostitutes. I am. So in a way, I hear that once you identify that that may be an issue, you offer a menu of options for the individual and the couple to, to get that further support. Yes. Absolutely. Uh-huh. I'm, and I'm constantly trying to um, give links also in the response. Right. right. So um, that it that, you know, it's right there. And the great thing about the forum, I mean, again, it's I'm, I'm attempting to reach people that otherwise wouldn't mm-hmm. have an opportunity to be reached. So this is by no means a way of dealing with sexual addiction or uh, helping a couple heal from betrayal. This, this is just the, this is just a, a one moment of an introduction uh, for them to then hopefully be on a, a helpful pathway in mm-hmm. their life rather than flailing around trying to figure out all this sort of stuff, feeling lost for a long period of time and then getting some clarity on what's actually going on. Mm, got it. So let's say uh, a wife from a small town in Nebraska finds your website, relationup.com. How would they specifically access you like like if you could walk our listeners through the process that would be great it's really simple and it's anonymous so my two favorite things Mm. um (laughs) they you just sign up and you uh you know create a name for yourself and then you just post a question on the forum all the forum questions are absolutely free and i invite people to ha- ask follow-up questions. So sometimes on the forum, someone will say, you said this, you know, what did you mean by that? Or here's some more information to answer uh, one of the options that you said to me. It usually takes me well over an hour to craft an answer. I mean, that's how yeah. much thought and work I put into every single answer. So you're not yeah. getting answers like, you know, uh, that are very superficial and, uh, you know, uh, feel like they come back out of um, a gumball machine, you know? Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. and then, um, so when I answer, I post it back on the forum. Some people have um, urgent questions or they feel that they're urgent. And Mm -hmm. so very, very nominal fee. Um, I let them, or they're given the opportunity to, um, pay for, uh, the service of asking a question immediately. And we have about two or three rounds, go arounds via email and um and that's just puts them at the front of the line mm-hmm. um and so that service is really available to mm-hmm. uh cover the cost of running the website and having a server and 
you know, uh, web services and stuff like that. You know, it's so interesting. I keep on coming back to the fact that you and I are both social workers from way back when. We, we right. You went to grad school in, in New York. I went to grad school in Los Angeles. And of course, one of the pillars of, of social work school was working with disenfranchised people and people of different socioeconomic backgrounds. And this particular project that you've launched really speaks to the social worker in me. It really warms my heart. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And I'm so glad you pointed that out because it is really true. And in some ways, you know, I'm, uh, I always kid my friends that are psychologists, but in some ways, this is what makes us go into social work as opposed to some other degree is that I do feel like social workers do have an innate calling to look out for community. I really do. Mm. And, you know, having known you, Rhonda, for many, many years and having known you in different versions of of us kind of growing up together clinically, it really strikes me that this is a next chapter for you and and that this particular resource that you've created offers something that really is different and and complements what what's out there but offers a, a different flavor of support and i i i just think it's fantastic and um i've i've so enjoyed our time talking today about it because i really didn't understand until you started to spell it out you know, how valuable uh, this can be for, for people really worldwide. Isn't that right? Yes, absolutely. And it's been such a pleasure to be speaking to you about it and sharing this with you and to have heard your very insightful comments about it. Um, so I, I really thank you for the opportunity of not only sharing this time with you, but, you know, hopefully sharing this website with others as well. And can you share once again the name of the website, please? Sure. It's relationup.com. That's relation, R-E-L-A-T-I-O-N-U-P.com. Fantastic. Well, it, it's a joy to spend time with you and, and to, to share you know, this opportunity to get to know more about what you've been up to. And I, as always, look forward to more time and more uh, adventures together, clinically and otherwise. Uh, That'd be great. And thank you again, Andrew. Thanks, Rhonda. Take good care. Thank you, you too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening today. It was so terrific sharing the time with my super talented colleague and friend, Rhonda Milrad and discussing this really vital topic that affects those affected by out-of-control sexual behavior and by betrayals. In this podcast, we took a look at educating and supporting those who are healing from betrayal. Be sure to give us a five-star rating on iTunes, and please share our podcast on Spotify. And if there are topics you'd like us to discuss in the future, just let us know. I look forward to you joining us on future podcasts and thanks again for being with us today.